Well, welcome to Mercy Vineyard Church Online. As you can see, I'm already outside. I'm waiting for you to come down here this evening at 4 p.m. We're going to be in the East parking lot, worshiping God together. Listen, I think it's time for God's people to cry out and spare not. Lift the name of Jesus up. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And if any time we need drawing, beloved, certainly it's now. Come on and sing this with me. Oh, yeah, let it be. Hallelujah. Oh, just a closer walk with thee. Granite, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord. Let it be. You know why? Because I am weak, but thou art strong. Keep me, Jesus, from all wrong. Now I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Come on, just a closer, just a closer walk with thee. Oh, granted, Jesus is my plea. Oh, daily walking close to thee. Oh, yeah, let it be. Dear Lord, let it be. Let's do verse 2. Though this world of toil and strength, if I fall to Lord, who cares? <laughs> who with me my burden shares? None but thee, dear Lord, none but thee. Just a closer walk. Oh, just a closer walk with thee. Granite, dear Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. See, daily again, yeah. Now, daily walking close to thee. Oh, oh. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm looking for you, come on down. Good morning, are you here for a sidewalk talk? Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to Sidewalk Talk announcements for a Sunday morning service with Julie Badertha. I'm Julie Badertha, communications lead here at Mercy. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what you can expect in our service this morning and some things that are coming up here at Mercy. So first, I'll share some announcements, then we'll hear preaching from the Bible, and after that we'll have a time of worship together. If you're joining us for the first time, we're so glad you're here today. Um, we'd love to have you let us know in the comments so that we can reach out and connect with you. And after the service live stream ends, we'll love to have everyone go to their summer small churches, the Zoom or in-person gatherings on Sunday mornings where we connect, we share communion together, and we uh, respond to a question. If you're new, if you haven't signed up yet for a 
summer small church or you're having trouble connecting with your group, we do have a summer small church that Pastor Cassie is leading. You can uh, join that Zoom call using the link in the post for this video. And then um, we'd love to have you uh, fill out our All Church Connect card. That's for those of you who are new and for those of you who have been here at Mercy for a long time. The All Church Connect card is a place where you can share your prayer requests with us. You can um, let us know about practical needs you may have or uh, ways you can help with the practical needs of others. And you can share stories with us of things that are happening in your life. We'd love to hear from you. It's a great way to connect with us and help us know how we can reach out and touch base with you. And uh, of course, today is a very special gathering. This afternoon, an evening of outdoor worship at 4 p.m. in the back parking lot of Mercy. We'd love to have you come back today and, and be together in person, worshiping outdoors. So park in the front or side of Mercy, bring your chair, and uh, swing on over to Falling Knife and pick up some of Waltz's wings, ribs, other goodies that he sells over there, and then come back to the back parking lot and we'll enjoy a time of worship together outdoors. And then uh, I just want to remind you about our giving opportunities. We thank you for supporting the work of Mercy. Those of you who have been giving for a long time and those of you who are just beginning your giving journey with us, uh, visit our, our push pay site on our webpage and in our app and, um, and you can give there. Thank you for supporting the work of Mercy. I'm going to head over to Erin Whitus' house and uh, have her help me tell you a little bit about another opportunity that's happening this summer. Well, hi, I'm here with Mercy community member Erin Whitus who to introduce uh, Mercy's Everyone Gets to Play Gatherings because Erin is hosting a South Metro gathering in, later in July. So when we talk about Everyone Gets to Play, uh, we're referring back to John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Movement. He used to say this phrase, everyone gets to play in, in the Vineyard Movement, in the faith, because we are all ordinary people who get to do extraordinary things. And one of the ways that we practice that reality at Mercy is with our summer Everyone Gets to Play gatherings in area parks where we hang out together, we hear and learn from one another about faith, and we play together. Uh, so this summer, Mercy is hosting regional Everyone Gets to Play gatherings from 6 to 8 p.m. on July 8th, July 22nd, and August 5th. Uh, visit our Mercy website and our Facebook page to find a location near you. Please bring your own food, chairs, blankets, uh, we've invited a couple of people to share stories as a part of the gathering, uh, and then we'll play lawn games and just have fun connecting with one another. Uh, we encourage you to invite your friends, family, neighbors. This is an informal opportunity to introduce uh, people to the Mercy community. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Julie. Now let's head over to Pastor John Marsden's house, where he'll preach from the Bible. Join me. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here at Mercy, and you see that we're recording from my backyard. That's South Valley Park behind me there. Uh, we love uh, this uh, yard. Our, my daughter and her kids live right next door. So it's, it's fun to be able to be here with you. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your 4th of July weekend, even without the big fireworks that we're used to seeing in the Twin Cities. You know, we've been experiencing so many changes this year. We're fighting a global pandemic, an economic recession, and racial injustice all at the same time. I have never lived through a time like this, and probably you haven't either. And I know many of us are struggling with feelings of fear and anxiety, or anger and depression. I know I have been. In fact, I grew up struggling with depression, and I fought it really my whole life. Uh, so when things would get hard for me, my default would be to retreat into my little cave and just hide. Not literally, but I would distance myself from others. Now, many followers of Jesus have fought depression over the centuries, so there's no shame in fighting this. Martin Luther, John Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, Mother Teresa, they all struggled with depression. And Charles Spurgeon, who you maybe don't know as well as those folks, but he was one of the greatest preachers England ever knew. His, his sermons would be preached in, in London, and the next week they'd be printed in the New York Times. He was just amazing, uh, well worth reading about. But he called depression the big black dog. And often he would say on Blue Mondays, after he'd preached many times on Sunday, 
he would say, the big black dog jumped on me and knocked me down again. But I looked to my savior and he lifted me up and he set me on my feet and I will praise him forever. So I wanna to talk to you today a little bit about where you and I can find the light that we need to navigate life well as we walk through these dark and challenging times. And then how can we help each other and others around us find the light they need? Now, my dad was a navigator on a battleship in the Navy in World War II. And he told me that he would set their course by the North Star because it was a fixed position in the sky and he always knew where he was if he could find the North Star. Instead, he said, I came to believe in God because I studied the stars and they were always there. Now, where can you and I find our North Star to set the course of our lives? Well, all through the Bible, God has promised to send a mighty deliverer to his people who would defeat death and darkness and bring light and life to all who would trust him. Isaiah is one of those prophets. He says this in chapter 9, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And for those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. I grew up in a farming community. So, oh boy, I have memories of people rejoicing when the harvest came in. <laughs> Wasn't all great, but they were rejoicing. Uh, they will rejoice before us. People rejoice at the harvest and like warriors who divide the plunder. For you, speaking again of the great deliverer, will break the yoke of their slavery. You will lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. Friends, Jesus is this great light that God promised. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And John declares in his gospel, the word gave life to everything that was created, all of this around us, there are animals back there. You can't really see them right now because the trees are pretty full, but we have deer that come by there often. We love that. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. You know, Jesus has come to shine on you and on me. He's come to show us who God really is, how much he loves us. He's come to set us free from everything that tries to bind us and, give a, and, and hold us back from becoming the people God wants us to be. And he's come to give you and I the power to be light in this dark world. The power to do good deeds and to say good words so that others will turn and trust Jesus and find this light of life. Now last week, Leo shared a great message from John 7. If you didn't uh, have a chance to hear it, I encourage you to go and listen to it. He showed us there in that message how Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the great Jewish festivals, and revealed himself as the one who provides living water to all who are thirsty and who come to him and drink. Now, water was a big theme for this festival, but so was light. In fact, each night of this festival, the priest would climb up tall ladders to these huge lamps that were filled with oil, and they would light them. And because Jerusalem had a lot of limestone in it, the light would reflect and the whole city of Jerusalem would be ablaze with light. Every courtyard was full of light. Uh, these lamps uh, would shine out all over Jerusalem. And people would sing and dance and they'd celebrate how God had delivered them from oppression in Egypt and how he'd led them by the pillar of fire during the night and the cloud during the day. Now, people would camp out in tents during this time, this festival, to demonstrate that they knew that they were, on a, they were pilgrims on a journey. And they were absolutely dependent on God for water, for bread, and light to guide them forward. Do you know, you and I are pilgrims on a journey. And we are absolutely dependent on God for our refreshing water, our nourishing bread, and our shining light to guide us forward in our destination. So on one of these great evenings when there was, they were celebrating, it was pretty spectacular, uh, Jesus stood up and he said these words, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You know, if you and I choose to follow this great Jesus, he promises that we will have all the light 
we ever need to live in every season, including this one. We won't be stumbling around in the darkness, even in a challenging time like this, because God will guide us. He will protect us with his presence. And then we'll be able to help others find the light that they need. So my question is, how can you and I consistently walk in the light that leads to life? Let's look at Jesus' promise more closely. He says, I am the light of the world, John 12, verse 8. So Jesus came to shine his light on everyone, not just for Israel. In fact, Isaiah 49 says this, you will do more than restore the people of Israel. Now that's a great thing to me, but I will make you a light to the Gentiles. Gentiles means nations, every ethnic group, every people group that's not Jewish. And you'll bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Jesus is the true light that shines upon every person. Now, we have an enemy who loves darkness more than light. The Bible calls him Satan or the devil. And Paul says, he's the one who blinds our minds so that we don't see the glorious light of the good news. We don't understand the message about who Jesus is. But God, who, who shined light in the darkness and first creation, has made his light shine in our hearts that we could know who Jesus is. Now, I was blind to Jesus for the first 19 years of my life. And I struggled with feeling darkness. I struggled with depression. And I was often afraid in the darkness. When, we, uh, when I was growing up, we lived in rural North Dakota, Milner, North Dakota, big town, 750 people. It was actually the biggest town I did grow up in growing up. I went into a smaller one after that. Uh, so, and, and my dad was superintendent of schools and his compensation included a house that we got to live in. Kind of like pastors sometimes would get parsonages Sorry, it's a really terrible idea. It is just terrible. If you live that way, you end up with no equity when you want it, when you retire. Uh, anyway, my mom hated those houses because she could never do anything with them. She never really chose them. But we had a big drafty house and it had a real basement. Now, I don't know if you know what a real basement is. We have a lower level here. It's not a basement. You can live there. In fact, we, 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 our kids live, slept down there. Our basement in Milner was a basement, dirt floor, had a coal bin back when they actually heated with coal and a lot of creepy, crawly critters uh, lived down there. Uh, my dad thought it would be a great place to, for me to learn how to play basketball. So it was eight foot ceiling, so he put a basketball hoop at the end, put down wooden railroad ties, and uh, you know, said you can go down there whenever you want and play basketball. And periodically my family would encourage me to go down there. Uh, you know, if I was too rambunctious or they wanted it quieter, John, why don't you go play basketball? So I would go down and so I'd open that door. And I remember now, I really don't like darkness. It's pitch dark there, it's damp. That's where creepy, crawly things live. Snakes, lizards, and other things I don't want to mention. So I had to do two things. I would, I would open the door, I'd turn the light on right away and then, and I would sing at the top of my lungs, either a, a song I knew or a song I'd made up. And <laughs> whether I was on key or not, those things would leave. They'd go and hide in corners. Then I'd play basketball for hours. I thought of that when I was getting ready for this message. You know, Jesus has come to sing over you songs that drive away darkness. And Psalm 40 says he's come to to lift you up out of a slimy pit, like my basement basement, out of the mud and mire, and put your feet on a rock and give you a firm place to stand, and he will put a new song in your mouth, a hymn of praise to our God, and then many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. I just want to encourage you, you have authority in Jesus to speak to darkness and command it to go and to sing away the darkness. Now, I sing, I sing a lot now in our home. I sing in my car. Uh, I liked what Leo said. He sings super loud when he's driving around. I do the same thing, um, mostly on key, I think. But anyway, I love singing. I love singing in my house. I love singing out here. Darkness leaves. Now, Tommy and our band did that last Saturday down in the, down in the uh, parking lot, Kmart parking lot on Lake Street. You know, and as they were worshiping and singing, you know, darkness was leaving. What kind of darkness do you need to sing away or speak to? You have authority. I would encourage you, 
use it for yourself, for your children. I mean, we, uh, you know, Sue and I with six kids, we had a routine of putting them to bed. We'd kind of divide them up three and three. As they got older, they didn't need as much time. We'd read to them, and of course, I would try to skip pages because I wanted to get it done. Not good. Uh, but they always knew, no, there's another page, and then I'd have to go back. But one of the things I would do, we'd sing, and we'd pray over them so that they wouldn't be afraid as they went to sleep. You know, God's a really good father. He doesn't want you gripped by any kind of fear. So he sings over you. Jesus goes on, if you follow me, you will not have to walk in darkness. So if you and I choose to follow Jesus, and I know uh, probably most of us that are listening to this have made that choice. If you haven't today, I'm going to pitch to you. It's a really great decision. It's the best decision I've ever made. It's an easy decision. You just have to say, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. I didn't really know any more than that. I discovered a lot more after that. Uh, but, and it was good, challenging and good. So if you choose to follow Jesus, you won't need to walk or live in darkness ever again. You'll have all the light you ever need in every season, in every situation. The darkness will not control you because Jesus has broken its power. Now, and he hasn't just given us a little glimpse of light. He's given us constant, enduring, lasting light that's for us. Now, five years ago, my wife Sue uh, and I were going to the Vineyard Global Conference in Columbus where people from all the nations were going to come and worship. We had a lot of friends from Mexico coming. We were hosting a lunch to celebrate what God was doing in Mexico and invite other people into it. And all of a sudden, Sue needed emergency surgery at the Ohio State University Hospital. And uh, uh, her stomach had exploded, and she easily could have died. But God rescued her and me and our whole family. Now, my son Eric and a pastor from the Columbus Vineyard sat and prayed with me all the time Sue was in surgery. Uh, Dan from Columbus, he was so kind. You know, I've done a lot of hospital visits, and I try to watch my time and not overdo it with people. Uh, Dan was an, had been an ER nurse, and he said, you know, I don't want to stay any longer than I want, but I'll stay as long as you want me to. And I said, would you please stay? And he did. He stayed for an hour. And then after Sue recovered and we knew we needed to stay in Columbus for 10 more days for her to recover, uh, I could have paid for a hotel for 10 days, didn't really want to, wasn't really prepared to financially. So I asked Dan, I don't know what to do here. And he said, I'll check. And he found a wonderful African-American couple that welcomed my daughter, Anna and I, for 10 days to stay in their home. And we both said when we were done, you know, if we lived in in the same town, we would be best friends. Now, they live in Columbus, we live here, so uh, I, I hope to see them in a, another day. But Jesus shined his light on my life and Sue's life through our family and through our friends. And you know, he will shine his light on you through your family and friends as well. Now, Jesus comes to give sight to those who are physically blind, like a guy named Bartimaeus, I mentioned putting our kids to bed. Our oldest son, Jonathan, when I would put him to bed, we'd read Bible stories, and I'd say, well, what, do you, what do you want me to read, John? He said, read the story about blind Bart. <laughs> and so I'd read about blind Bart and how Bart was sitting on the roadside, and he was begging, doing his job, and he hears all this commotion. And he says, what's happening? What's happening? He says, Jesus of Nazareth is coming to town. And so he starts screaming out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And of course, the people said, shut up. We're having a parade. You know, don't mess up our parade. Bart, he didn't care. He shouted all the more because he needed Jesus' help. And Jesus stopped. Don't you love Jesus? How he just would stop for people. He was accessible. So many of the miracles, I encourage you to read this in the Gospels, happened when Jesus was interrupted. He was on their way somewhere else and someone broke in and he stops. And so he says, what do you want? Which... Hey, Jesus, that seems like kind of a silly question. It's the eyes. They don't work. But, you know, Jesus wants you and I to have a real relationship with him. He wants us to talk to him about what we actually want. And so he invited Bartimaeus. That's a question I ask when I pray with people regularly. What would you want like Jesus to do? It, it's not always easy, and sometimes we don't know. But it's a good exercise to learn, well, what do I really want? What do I really need? So Bart said, I want to see! And Jesus said, see, 
And then he, he did, and he got up and he followed Jesus. And I believe he followed Jesus his whole life long. So Jesus can bring light to us uh, and bring healing physically to any kind of blindness we have. I have seen some people's eyesight improve. I've never seen an actually fully blind person heal. I would really love to do that, see that before I go to heaven. I would so love to be part of that. Uh, but Jesus also gives sight to those who are spiritually blind, like Saul. And then he turns us and uses us to help others. So Paul says this in Acts 26. About noon I was on the road, and a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. The Lord replied, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. So get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness to tell people that you've seen me. Tell them what I'll show you in the future. I'll rescue you from your own people and the Gentiles. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. To do what? To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. They will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. So Paul had the wonderful experience of Jesus' light, interestingly, also blinding him for three days. So he was physically blind, spiritually blind, but he was awakened. Then Ananias came, prayed for him, and he could see and then God used Paul's life to help other people see his whole life long. He wants to do the same kind of thing for you. I don't mean you have to be a preacher like Paul, but your life is light to others. The way you live, the choices you make, the way you care about your family, your friends, the way you do your job, the way you handle your money, the encouraging words you say, the prayers you pray, all of that's light. Now, you may be a preacher. I'm not trying to stop you from being a preacher. I never thought I'd ever be a preacher. I refused to take speech in high school. I refused to take it in college. So I had to take remedial public speech in seminary because I was so far behind everybody else. <laughs> God's got a good sense of humor, doesn't he? He loves to, sh his power shows up in your weakness and in my weakness. So Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. You won't have to walk in darkness because what? You will have the light that leads to life. John 8, 12, C. So, how can we walk consistently in the light that leads us to life? Jesus says this in John 8, 31. You're truly my disciples because some had begun to believe in him as he was presenting this. You're truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So we have a choice, you and I. Are we going to invest ourselves in life with Jesus and get to know him better, get to know his teaching better, actually learn how to apply them to our lives? I would really encourage that because Jesus is way smarter than I am. And all humbly, I would say he's way smarter than you are too. And so you get the best ideas about life from Jesus if you will invest your life in seeking him out. Interestingly, so these wonderful Jewish people said, well, we're descendants of Abraham and we've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you'll be set free? I just think it's interesting. A little bit of revisionist history. Israel was enslaved to everybody. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. Now, I think what they may be saying was, but we've kept our Jewish identity. We have our kosher food. We have our music. We have our traditions. We live in the same area. And none, none of that's a bad thing. Traditions can be, are wonderful, they bind families together and so on. But there is something that's not so great. If you put your trust in your ethnic identity, it could become idolatry. What do I mean? Well, idolatry is trusting anything or anyone other than God for your security, for your significance, for your satisfaction, for your love, joy, peace in life, anything else becomes an idol. So idols are usually not horrible things. They're good things that we make ultimate, that our life depends on them. <clears throat> so I think that's what was going on here. And Jesus said, hey, anyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave isn't a permanent member of the family. A son is. So if the son, Jesus, sets you free, you are truly free. Now, this is so amazing. Jesus, the light of the world, wants to set you and I free from everything that has ever gripped us kind of bent us out of shape because that's what idolatry does. It demands your whole life and it will twist you. And so part of coming to faith in Jesus is becoming untwisted and be ma being made upright, kind of being straightened up. Now, I want to say a couple things here. 
uh, you know, and you're welcome to email me with any response to these things. I'm a pretty good responder to email. We're moving toward an election in November. Could I say to you that you and I as followers of Jesus must learn to see that our first and our highest citizenship is in heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Our secondary citizenship is in whatever country we live in, whether it's U the U.S. or Mexico or Canada or Europe. And you and I are not called as followers of Jesus to make America great again. You and I are called to make Jesus famous all over the world. Nationalism is trusting in our nation's military power, economic power, brilliant wisdom to make us secure. Friends, that's idolatry. I don't know if you've thought about it that way. Nationalism is idolatry. And we as followers of Jesus, I believe, must repent of this and reaffirm our trust in Jesus and really know him. Now, racism and white supremacy, trusting in our white privilege as the dominant race and the one who gets to set the bar. I read a sports, I love sports. I'm excited the sports is coming back even though we can't go physically, I can watch it. Chip Sc Scoggins, who is a columnist on the Tribune, he did a study of all the pro sports and college sports teams in Minnesota and there are 79 people in, in significant leadership in those sports, 71 are white. That's kind of sad to me, especially when the huge percentage of the players are African-American and from other ethnicity. Now, when you think of white supremacy, I think usually we go to the most extreme, like, you know, neo-Nazis or whatever. Friends, I think that simply means is we have, we've made the decisions, we've, get to, we've gotten to be in charge and we've benefited so much. So can I encourage, do not trust in that, that's idolatry. Trust in God who wants to bless all peoples of all colors. Now, the good news is you can, I can be set free from all of this. We can live free from idolatry, free from the burden of our own sins and the pain we've experienced from others who have sinned against us, free from the power of darkness that tempts and accuses and harasses and lies, and free to love and serve others with all the gifts our generous God has given us. So how can you and I consistently walk in this light? Well, the first thing, friends, is to come to the light. Come to the light. If you, if you want some music on this, Kevin Prosh has an album titled that, Come to the Light. It's an awesome album. David Roos has a wonderful song, See the Light. There's lots of great songs about this. You might want to look at some of them. Come to the light. Jesus will guide you into the best path for your life. He will clear up confusion. He'll give you his purpose. He'll help you see your gifts and how they can be used. He'll help you make the biggest difference ever with your own life in this world. Come to the light. Get to know who God is more and more clearly. He's a good and generous father. Jesus is your loving elder brother. The Holy Spirit's your counselor, comforter, your coach. Come to the light. Be set free from everything that's ever held you back from being all that God wants you to be. Come to the light, experience his light, and then go and be the light in this dark world. You can do more good than you can imagine. Let's do that together. Lord, we thank you today that you are the light of the world, Jesus, that you've shined on us and that we reflect your light all over the world, everywhere we go. Lord, we would like to do that more and more clearly. And so we come to you. We thank you that you've shined on us and will continue to shine on us and lead us forward. We thank you that you're doing this all across your church, all over the world. Lord, would you do this more in our, each of our lives personally and us as a community? We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, John, for the message today. I just wanted to take time to do one of the songs that we've done, that we did, that me and John came up with doing one of our worship songs. I, it's only, I'm only going to do 30 seconds of it, so I don't know if we even get it. But I just wanted to do something that we did as a community. This is why I'm just looking forward to seeing you this evening. Because things happen when you come together. In the name of Jesus, things happen. I 
remember he was playing this and I just started singing. I surrender my all to you.
Hallelujah. 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 Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I want you to be a relevant, relevant thing in our lives. Not even relevant. In the hearts of men. A necessity. Yes. Something we have to have. God, we need you. And so God, I know that you care about us. That's why you're going to chase us. <laughs> you're going to come at us. Listen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. I've been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathe your life in me. And you have been so, so kind. Till 
Who I am, you 
Thank you, Tommy, for and this team for leading us in worship. Uh, now we encourage you to go to Summer Small Church. Uh, you should have received an invitation from your host to connect to a, a Zoom call for that. And if you haven't signed up, you still can. There's space in the different groups. Uh, I'm part of a wonderful group that meets kind of in my area of town. Uh, we'd love to have you in a group. So if you're a visitor here then and you haven't signed up, you could join Pastor Cassie. She leads a group as well. And uh, we would love to have you join us for, you'll be able to take communion. There'll be a question we, you can interact with. You could get some prayer in those groups. So we'd love to have you. Thanks so much for joining us today. God bless you. Have a great week.